Hi, nice to meet you all. My name is Sabine Wieluch. I'm a PhD student at Ulm University, Germany in the Institute of Neural Information Processing. In my research, I'm very interested in co-creative sketching or drawing with AI agents and robots. And well, sketching is still a very commonly used technique despite all the technology we have. It's still, yeah, very often seen, very commonly used to just grab a pen and paper and draw a quick sketch, like capture your thoughts that you have, or also make a quick scribble as a visualization of something you want to explain to another person. And well, today I want to show you my current research work, which is called Stroke Coder. Uh, it is about generating sketches or drawings with machine learning that can be used in the future for casual creators or to enhance creativity in like sketching drawing situations or also augment your current sketches with an AI agent that is helping you in yeah in creative or design situations. So for the generation process, I have three points that are very important and also very specific for my use cases, I think. Um, the first one is that the newly, the newly generated images should match the draw's style. So the idea is to give one or few sample images that are created by an artist or by the person that is interacting with the agent um, and that the system can generate new images, but these should in some way stay true to the original style, because if they don't, I can just like generate random Im images. It doesn't matter to have a fancy generation algorithm. The second point is that I want to work with very small data sets, because in most design processes, it's not uh, suitable for the creative person to create a huge data set uh, that is then fed to a machine learning algorithm to produce uh, new stuff because the generation or like the, the gathering, gathering process of all that of all the data set parts is such a time consuming task that it's just not suitable. So I want to work with very small data sets and in the case of this re research I will only work with one example image that is given by the user to the system. And the third point is that I want to work with path data and not with pixelated images, so basically with vector graphics. Because the use cases that I see are, for example, digital fabrication, where you work with laser cutters, 3D printers, CNC machines, pen plotters. And these are all devices that uh, need to work with the path data so they can move the pen or the tool along a certain path. So when you look at vector graphics, you have the problem that they are not really that defined in size. They basically can consist of an infinite number of strokes uh, compared to pixel images where you usually work with a very fixed resolution. Um, so that, well, that undefined size is a bit of a problem, but uh, luckily it's not that hard to serialize uh, the image into one very long, uh, yeah, long sequence of lines. Because as I said, you have a sequence of strokes or curves that uh, a user is drawn. And these curves can very easily be approximated by small, uh, short straight lines. And now you can just take these small lines and arrange them in the order of the strokes and you have a quickly serialized image. And now what we have is something very similar to turtle graphics, where you can imagine you have a virtual pen that is moving over the canvas and it can either draw or not draw because now when you have that serialized uh, string of moves that the pen can do, you also need to have moves where the pen is not drawing, like because you want to end a line and want to start another. So you have uh, moves where the pen either draws or does not, the direction where it moves, how long it moves. And uh, we also introduced one move that indicates the image end. So these moves, like these small straight lines, either drawing or just moving the pen, um, are the inputs to our machine learning algorithm. 
And because we work with sequences, we chose transformers because they are the current state of the art machine learning archi archi architectures for sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation tasks, for example, but also for sequence generation. Like maybe you have seen uh, GPT-3 is, I think, very popular uh, for, uh, be, for, in, for being able to generate very huge, fancy, consistent kinds of text. And, well, we used uh, basically the same architecture. So let's take a quick look and on how the transformer works. So as I said, as an input, we have these pen moves, but now comes the very interesting part. This uh, is the self-attention of a transformer. So the transformer is able to focus on a certain parts of the sequence that it gets and can then, because of this focus, of these weights, can better decide uh, on what uh, it wants to predict in the next step. And basically these, um, these focus layers, these self-attention layers can be stacked multiple times. And at the end, you end with a linear and a softmax layer. And a softmax layer basically gives you one very huge vector with probabilities for each possible move that you could do. Um, and then you can either decide you go with a one-hot encoded vector, and which is, would be a super large vector where at one position it puts a one and that indicates. So that's the move that has the highest probability. Or also you can choose other sampling techniques to choose which could be the next move. And we will also take a look into these uh, sampling possibilities. So as I mentioned earlier, we only want to work with one example image. And sadly, this is not enough. Like one image is not enough to train a transformer neural network. So what we do is we augment this image into a very huge dataset that is then used to train our uh, machine learning architecture. And to do so, we are altering the image in ways that the image look stays the same, but we can uh, still change certain aspects. For example, we can scale the image we can uh, rotate it, mirror it, translate it. We can also change the stroke direction. So instead, when a stroke went up before, we can uh, invert it so the stroke now went down. Okay, now to the real fun part. <laughs> we recorded four images to test them with users and also see how the generation progress goes. Um, the first one is called curls. It consists of a lot of spirals. The second one is called boxes. It has stacked boxes and is also symmetric. The third one is called spikes. So it's like small, like, yeah, spikes or triangle angle sort of parts. And the last one is called circles. And it's a very curvy line, um, which has uh, circles on it in different sizes. So let's take a look at some generated images. These images were generated with the boxes image as inspirational or template image. And what you can see is, I think it's very nice. You can see the boxes very clearly. They resemble the original boxes. You can also see stacked boxes. There's a nice variety in these images. They differ a lot from each other. Um, what, what you can also see is that the symmetry of the original image is somehow lost. So the the lines itself are fine, but the, often the placement is a bit off, but we will look into that also later. So in this case, we were experimenting with different vector or sequence lengths of the uh, transformer to start the generation process. So you usually have to give the, gener uh, the transformer some sort of start that it can start predicting new, uh, yeah, new pen moves in our case. And uh, what you can see here is half of the uh, training sequence length that we chose. And these are, uh, yeah, make very nice images. I think they resemble the original image quite well. But you can also uh, instead um, go with a vector that is only consisting of the image and token. So there's basically basically no, uh, but not much information that it starts off. And if you choose to do so, the images start to often get very short. The strokes also get very short. And well, we also had a lot of images that were basically empty. So the insta uh, on the image end token, the transformer decided to directly next predict the image end token. So this can also happen. So these images are very, yeah, maybe sparse, like 
they do not contain too much content, but are also fine, like they still very nicely, uh, very well resemble the original image. It's just they are a, a bit short, so to say. <laughs> and you can also go the other way around and instead choose a very long uh, starting, random starting sequence. And this has the effect that it sort of confuses the transformer. You can see that now uh, lines are generated that do not resemble the original image very well and well they seem so yeah the transformer seems sort of com confused it makes a lot of lines that well do not really fit but it depends on your <clears throat> it depends on your application i'd say uh, so if for example if um, you want to use this generation in a situation where you want to enhance creative processes it might be ex uh, especially interesting uh, to use these, yeah, like different new creations that do not resemble the original too much. So I think it depends on your application, what uh, starting sequence length you want to use. We were also experimenting a lot with sampling. So you can see if you choose the greedy sampling technique that you end up with very nice images. They fit very well to the, or also very well to the original image, but you can also see that yeah, you uh, often have very similar images or basically identical images. And on the other, ha other hand, if you choose top K sampling, um, yeah, you get a very nice, huge variety. The images might look not as nice as the images with the greedy one, but you get a much higher variety. So I, I'd say in most cases, it's suitable to choose some sort of top K sampling or some sort of sampling and not go with the greedy approach. Um, and in natural language processing, it also depends on your application, how you choose top case sampling or what sampling you choose. And I think it's the same here in this case. So if you want to have a very broad, very, very broad, very, very high variety of images, it's wise to choose a large K for top K sampling. And if you want them to be more, more true to the original, choose a low K in top K sampling. And last but not least, we did a very uh, small study to see if the images really fit to the original image. So what we did, we, we took all our four example images and generated images from these and we showed them to 18 people and they were asked to choose from a set of 12 adjectives that described the images. These were adjectives like <clears throat> symmetrical, straight, curly, wavy, spiky, uh, yeah, uh, 12 such adjectives, and they should choose which one described the image best, uh, according to their opinion. And uh, we wanted to see if between the original image and the generated image, these adjectives would change per person, of course, because it's very different. Uh, uh, images are very differently perceived between persons, so you cannot compare different persons, but you can always compare the one person if the original image uh, description basically changes from the original to the generated images. And what you can see uh, in the evaluation is that it works very differently between images. So with the curls and the circles image, it's about two or three adjectives that change and they were free to choose as many as they want from these 12 adjectives. So not much changed, but to be, uh, in the boxes and in the spikes, image, a lot more adjectives changed. And we think this is because our generation method is not very good in placing the strokes. Though the strokes themselves are, are good, they very well resemble the image, but the placement is often not optimal, especially if you have images like the boxes images uh, with symmetry or um, other very uh, distinct spatial information. And in the curls and circles image, this information was not that prominent. So for future research, we would like to try different approaches for a better representation of the um, spatial features of these images. We, were th we are thinking about using uh, graph neural networks, for example, uh, or uh, hierarchical approaches so that we have neural nets that only focus on the strokes and we have neural nets that only focus on the placement of the strokes. 
And I think it would be very fun. And we hope that in the future we see more uh, path and stroke drawing research uh, in the generative scene. We are also currently working on utilizing these generation techniques on AI agents that will support you in drawing situations. Um, so you can basically use them as some sort of stamps or brushes uh, with AI support. And well, uh, I hope you found this talk interesting. Please contact me if you have any questions or want to discuss about this topic. And I wish you a great second day at the Casual Creators Workshop. Bye.